<clears throat> this morning we continue with our series on the book of Proverbs, and we've entitled this series God's Wisdom versus Man's Wisdom, and we are considering Proverbs chapter 3, and this morning I've entitled the message Fear the Lord. I invite you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. We're going to read verse 7 and 8. So Proverbs chapter 3, just reading verse 7 and 8. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. The world that we are living in does not fear the Lord. All reverence for sacred and godly things have been discarded. Now, this has not always been the case. We know that the world has not been a Christian world. I would debate with most people that there hasn't been a Christian government. So we understand the worldly systems and the world we're living in, there's always a motive, there's always something that is for self-gain. We haven't had this whole Christian utopia that many have hoped for, but when you look throughout history, although people weren't all saved and it wasn't this Christian world, people showed respect to the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible. Even pagan kings showed that respect. And the world that we are living in is what Psalm 2 basically speaks of when it says we're going to cut the cords and basically break those chains. Our world throughout the last, I would say, specifically 20 to 30 years, there's been a, a, a clear focus to destroy any Christian heritage in any respect for a monotheistic God, the God of the Bible. And therefore, all fear of the Lord is gone in the eyes of even Christians today, but especially within the world that we are living in. If we turn to Psalm 36, so it's close to Proverbs, just go slightly to the left and you should find it, of course. If you start looking around Genesis, then come and chat to me after the service. So uh, Psalm 36, we just want to read from verse 1 to 4. And this is what David spoke of many, many years ago. This is then, but look at what he writes. An oracle within my heart concerning the transgression of the wicked. There is no fear of God before his eyes, for he flatters himself in his own eyes when he finds out his iniquity and when he hates. The words of his mouth are wickedness and deceit. He has ceased to be wise and to do good. He devises wickedness on his bed. He sets himself in a way that is not good. He does not abhor evil. Is this not the world we're living in? Again, the issue is not the fact that we have people that aren't Christians that don't want to go to church. That's one thing. But when the authorities, when people are actively promoting sin and evil and that which destroys, it's a completely different issue we're dealing with. That we now see clearly that all fear and respect of the Lord is gone. And the reason why is because what's interesting is when you look at many years ago, people showed respect in families and to structures and those almost cultural frameworks were there to make people respectful. I remember even as a child in South Africa when a, a, a funeral uh, procession was happening when when the hearse would go by people would stop and they would take the hat off and show that respect that's gone mm. now where does this come from it doesn't mean that people have been more evil i can tell you about sodom and gomorrah in a bit we're not going to but don't think that people are worse today than they were then people have always been people children have always been naughty that's what they do they, they push boundaries but what we have is when society starts dismantling positive cultural boundaries of respect, things start fraying and falling apart. That's the issue we're dealing with. 
There's an active process now. And please, I'm saying this with tears in my navy red eyes. Let us not think that it's not the governments of the world that's part of that. If we live in this naivety of saying, no, it's just the people here. Where do they get these things from? Where is it coming from? It's when the government starts fiddling with things they shouldn't be fiddling with. They got one job, keep us safe and get some jobs going. That's it. But when they start dictating to people how they should live their lives, get involved in families, get involved in all kinds of things in schools and structures and tell churches what they have to do, society starts falling apart. And David wrote this thousand years before Christ, and he spoke about people, and this is what we have today. So any person or any country who does not fear the Lord will suffer consequences. And those consequences will not just be spiritual consequences, but also physical consequences. And this is not to say that God will bless specifically, actively, a country because they're wanting to be spiritual. I'm not saying that specifically, but what I'm saying is when you follow godly wisdom, there will be positive consequences. When you actively try and destroy biblical wisdom, there will be consequences. And the Western world, generally that was built on Judeo-Christian values, had certain positive consequences in the structures it followed. When you start destroying those structures, society will start falling apart. So revolution is great until no one has anything. Revolution is great until your child comes home and starts saying things. That's great. Now I want my child to explore and just be free and do whatever they want. They come home. And that's the trouble we're dealing with here, that it affects all of us. But we're not here to change the world. We're here to talk about us as God's people. Because these things will seep in and will filter into the church. This lack of respect. That we sit with, a, with, with basically churches in our country want to change the gender in the Bible. And they get away with it if it's normal. There's no riots. It's normality. It's okay. And this is, these are the issues we're dealing with. It's coming into the church. And that's my concern is not the world. I can't change governments and change the stuff they do. But I can say for us as a church, we have to be like Joshua. As for us, we will serve the Lord. Makes sense. We will take a stand to serve the Lord. And we'll be out of step. Be slightly different from the other churches or whatever they want to do. I, I can't be worried about them, but I'm saying for us, we have one responsibility as every father has a responsibility for his home. So the pastor has a responsibility and we have a responsibility as a church to stand upon the word of God. That is my only responsibility. We are not chefs. We are waiters. God does what he needs to do. You just pass it along. Don't touch it. Don't change it. Don't put more salt on. Don't put more pepper on. Don't take the butter nut away. And don't try and cook the steak even more. Leave it. But the church wants to fiddle. God gives us something we want to fiddle and make it better because it's going to appeal to people. You know what it's going to do? It's not going to taste right. And that's what we've done with the gospel. So turn with me again to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. I'm just going to read verse 29 to 31. Again, speaking about people and dealing with this with wisdom. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Because they shall eat the fruit of of their own way. Do you see the consequences there? You reject God's wisdom and the fear of him, and you will eat the fruit of that, which will be great consequences. And those consequences extend to families, communities, society, country, and the world. It will be like that. Now, there has always been a difference between God's people and the world. And the difference is that God's people Worship, fear, and respect the Lord. That's the difference. Now, we're not talking about just being respectful toward God. That's the world's, what the world must do. The world must just be respectful. 
For us as Christians and God's people, it's not just about being respectful. It's about the worship, the respect, the awe, the, the, the appreciation and love for the Lord. There's more to that than just respect. And the Christian is called to worship the Lord, to walk in him. Proverbs 9.10, which we, we, we spoke about last week, and it's, it's probably the, the verse throughout this whole series that's so important. Proverbs 9.10 says, fear the Lord, because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So to fear the Lord starts the process of for us to be able to function in a godly way in this world. So when we look at Proverbs 3, if you can just turn there with me, we're going to keep, that's going to be our focus, of course. So if we look at, do not be wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Let's firstly look at human wisdom. Do not be wise in your own eyes. It's quite interesting. It doesn't say be, do not be wise in their eyes. It says don't be wise in your own eyes. Because all of us here, and that includes the guy behind the pulpit, all of us here have a tendency to have an elevated view of our own opinions and perspectives. We do. I've shared this before, and I'll share it again because it's an emotive subject to me. I don't understand how anyone can support another football team but Manchester United. I don't get it. Like, I'm saying, well, how? I could never do that. I know it's an issue. I could never go and support another team and be passionate about it because it's just something. I don't get it. I don't understand because I think that my perspective is always right. And that's why it's, it's an awkward thing to be able to to think of someone else's perspective being true as much as yours is, because as human beings, we think that we see the world perfectly clearly. It's like this, isn't it? It's 100% like that. And so church becomes difficult because everyone comes to church and everyone has an opinion and everyone thinks their opinion's right. It's how we are as people. But it's not just our opinions, but also our perspectives. We think the way that we see the world is the right way. Now, yes, we see it through our own eyes. And that's important. You must um, understand that. It's, it's good. But it doesn't always mean the way that we see the world and our opinions of the world is always the correct one. Because all of us can become arrogant and self-focused at times. And arrogance, please, let us right-size what arrogance is. Arrogance is not the guy who walks in smelling of bad aftershave and sort of thinking he's God's gift to woman and walking around and, and with this sort of swagger that people think that's what arrogance is. No, no, that's not, that's, that is arrogant, but arrogance goes far deeper than that. And everyone thinks, oh, I know what arrogance is. Please, I've met quite a few sweet people who are super arrogant, but you would never say that. Because what is arrogance? Arrogance is your opinion. You, you think that you are right. And everyone else has to conform to what you think. So all of us can be arrogant and self-focused at times. And please identify that. And that's why the instruction here is, do not be wise in your own eyes. And why do we become arrogant? Why? How do we see the world? And I thought through this, so, so please bear with me. I'm trying to use examples. So please don't take it super personally, everything I will say. But I was thinking through what this, what this means and what this looks like. Because all of us have been exposed to so many things. All of us are molded and shaped by the family we grew up in, by the school we went to, by the society we've been a part of. All of us have. And depending on where you come from, what has shaped you, what has molded you, you see the world through those eyes. And that's why it's important for us as Christians, culturally coming together from different cultures and different places. We are coming together based on God's word, not your culture, not your family, not your perspective. Because those things are deceptive. And I'll explain to you why I say that. Because we've all been exposed to so many things, opinions and perspectives from other people. I love people that say they know something. Most people, 
I say this quite categorically because my opinion is right. <laughs> no, but what happens is that most of us, let's be honest, you know, most of us have an opinion based upon secondhand information. Not so? I've read a book. Oh, yes. I know about this topic. Why? Because I read this book. Now, there's nothing wrong with reading the book, but you don't just read one book on a topic. You need to read several to be able to formulate actually an opinion. The problem is that all of us know everything about everything because I've read the newspaper. I've read something on Google. We don't have first-hand information. If you go to university and you're preparing a thesis or a paper, you must go to what source? Second-hand sources or primary sources? You need primary sources. And everyone's an expert. Whether it's climate change, everyone knows everything about climate change because they've read a book. And that goes for either way. I don't know enough to worry about it. And the same on everything in life. Everyone's got an opinion because they've read a book by someone. Have you studied it? Have you actually looked at it? Are you an expert in that field? It doesn't mean you can't have an opinion. You can, of course, based upon something you've read. But we have to be very, very careful that our view of the world does not get shaped by other people. I see this theologically every time. This minister used to teach this, or he taught me that. I've heard this. Everyone has a theological opinion based upon the church you came from or grew up in. And we actually haven't read the text. People quote Bible verses to me, and I ask them, have you read the verse? Yes, no, I know the verse. Have you read the verses before and after? No, of course not. So we have to be careful. And that, as I said, I speak to myself. That's why I've put this, this really striking jacket on today, because I speak to myself. Because on, to be honest with all of us here this morning, we don't know where the truth starts and ends in our life, do we? And I'll explain to you why I say that. Because with social media, with with what happens on the news or social media or YouTube or whatever it is, we are getting information from people that you don't know their background. You don't know what they're saying is true. Biblically, it's easy because a guy preaches a sermon. Where do I go to find the truth? There, it's simple. But when someone starts talking about, you know, things, I'm just literally stealing from them. And then I go to a conversation. I'm like, no, 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 that's the truth. I heard this other guy speak about this. Now, just be aware of that. Because how can we know the truth and wisdom in this world? How can you honestly know what the truth is? Do you believe in propaganda? Do you believe in that? Do you believe it's true? Yes. I'll share with you something that was quite striking. I've never been to the Apartheid Museum in South Africa. I've never been, but my wife has. So if you want to know, please talk to her. She was there. I, don't, I didn't generally go to Johannesburg. I was too scared. It was quite a scary place. But she went to the Apartheid Museum. And it was quite interesting. Because I could never understand my grandparents having a tinge of racism. I'm saying tinge to be nice to them. It was rough. And you're thinking, where does this come from? And then in the, when you go to the apartheid museum in Johannesburg, you get posters that they used to put up at the schools and give to people. And they would paint this picture of this beautiful community of houses and play areas. And you have all the, the black kids in South Africa, and they would be running and playing in their beautiful school uniforms. And there'd be hospitals, beautiful hospitals and beautiful schools. And then the government would tell the white people to say, don't worry, look how beautiful it is where they are because no one goes there anyway. And you have this whole history of propaganda in South Africa where a minority who dominated the majority through various means were brainwashed in believing that everything's okay on that side of the fence. So I'm using one example. And then people would say, no, no, I know the truth. I know what's happening in Soweto or Mamelodi or these places. I know what's happening. Do yourself a favor. And that's what I'm saying. Please take what I say with a pinch of salt. If you do yourself a favor, go to Google, which is, of course, the source of truth. Go to Google and, and, and type in COVID posters. Type in the COVID posters. What I found very interesting, I, 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 I don't have it yet. I've got, I'll download them. It's quite interesting that the COVID posters that they used are exactly the same as the World War II posters. Frontline, save lives. They even got the lady. It's quite amazing. You know the lady? We're going to go to the, 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 um, the factories. 
and they got the you know the, the also the rationing one they got the picture of a rationing and they sort of say don't so when people were all going to Sainsbury's and taking all the toilet paper um they put out this poster of the rationing post it was all the same posters because why because we wanted to push people into a certain idea whatever if it's the truth or not it's not my not the conversation yet but if we are saying that it's okay to believe propaganda if the end of it is true then i'm very concerned because what about the iraqi war there are weapons of mass destruction we need to go in and sort it out yes and then there are no weapons of mass destruction so when the bible says do not be wise in your own eyes i'm asking us where does our wisdom come from what do we know what do you actually know and this doesn't mean that there's no such thing as truth, but you've got to find out. You've got to research those things of truth because when it comes to godly wisdom, it's very different from the world's wisdom. Mm -hmm. and I said, I'm not saying that to offend. I'm saying this is the reality of whenever you want to go to war, these posters start coming out. The Americans used to love Uncle Sam, not so. Sam needs you. This is the worst one I found was a lady that says brave men go to war and she stands at the kitchen looking out. Now, what does that do to a man? You know what that does to a man? It's like, what? Are you saying I'm not brave? I don't, I'm going, I'm going. Because the worst thing you can do is affect a man's ego because we can't cope with that. Don't say that I'm not strong or not being able to deal with things. You understand the manipulation of those dynamics? And so... As you are here with us and as we are in this church, what is true, what is not true? And that's not the issue. The issue is do not be wise in your own eyes. Do not think that your perspective, your opinion, the way that we see the world in our human flesh mm. is the way the world is. It's not always like that. Mm. Because what happens for the believer is sometimes our wisdom, our personal wisdom is in the middle between a bit of the world and what they tell us and a bit of the Bible, and we put it all together, we mix it up a bit, and then what we bake and what we get is this mixture of two things. Because of our culture, of where we're brought up, how we live, to our perspective of life, we bring that in, we take the Bible and what suits us in our thinking about the Bible, we put that together, we mix it all up, we bake it for a bit, and we get this mm. loaf cake, okay? We get this cake, and we're like, yeah. That's, that's the truth. And sometimes I know biblically that unless I read the passage in its context, I could be wrong biblically. And I could be wrong about the world. And if I bring all of this together, what is actually my perception? It's not a correct one. So we must be careful not to judge according to our own judgments. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 7, this famous passage that people love. Matthew 7. So Matthew 7, verse 1 and 2. And remember, what's important is when you read the Bible, the Bible does not contradict itself. So you can't take one passage out of its context. You need to read it in the context of the whole passage. So Matthew 7, verse 1 to 2 says, Judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with what measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And what was Jesus Christ speaking about? They were speaking about the measure that the Pharisees were using to judge people. Because the Pharisees took the law and then brought their own wisdom. So where the law says, you know, at certain times, wash your hands, maybe once, purify yourself. The, 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 the Pharisees would say, that's not enough. You need to do it several times. When you had to fast, one fast on the Day of Atonement, no, 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 we need more fasts. So they would add to the Word of God and build on this in their own wisdom. And what Jesus is referring to here in Matthew 7 is he's saying to the people, don't use the measure they use. Because the way that they're judging you by saying you're not spiritual enough is a human judgment, not a biblical one. In the same way, when it comes to our own wisdom, we cannot look at people with our own wisdom and judge them according to that. Because one thing I find very interesting about Christians is, trust me, we are all more judgmental than God is. Mm. We are far harsher on each other than what God is toward us. And that's why if you want to use that measure, it's really tough for us. 
Mm. I was saying, Faye and I, and I was chatting the week, and I was chatting to her, and I was saying, trust me, if David came to our church and applied for membership, he wouldn't make it. Can you imagine at a members meeting? We've got this guy who's been coming to church with his, um, his wife. And what's happening is he wants to apply for membership. He really looks like a good guy, loves the Lord, wants to apply for membership. But let's look at his history. Oh, yes. Okay, so basically he committed adultery with this woman and killed her husband. Who votes for him? Come in. Anyone? I'm not saying we should just allow anyone. It's not the point. The point just is David is a man after God's own heart. But from human eyes, it's like it's gone for him. Mm. Solomon's gone. Samson definitely wouldn't want him near the ladies in the church. Abraham, contrast that guy with his wife. He'd also sell her off quickly to Pharaoh. I mean, I can just go through the road gallery. Elijah wouldn't get up on a Sunday. We'll have to go and fetch him because he's moaning. There's no one else here. There's no one coming. You can imagine Elijah. No one's coming to church on Sunday. There's no one else who wants to serve the Lord but me. He could be super depressed. <laughs> also turn with me to Romans 12, verse 16. It's amazing when the New Testament picks up on these beautiful things in the Old Testament. So Romans 12, verse 16. It says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. That's worldly wisdom. It's your own opinion, own perspective. So what we need to do as Christians is be slow to speak and far quicker to listen. And make sure that when you are confident and convicted about something, it's biblical truth. Other things you need to hold slightly lightly because it could come back to bite you. Secondly, let's look at godly wisdom. Because, of course, in Proverbs it says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, of course, you can have many ministers who can bang the pulpit this morning and say, fear the Lord. We must fear the Lord. What does that fear mean? When you look at the Hebrew word for fear, it means reverence. Or awe, it means respect, acknowledgement, and to care for something is to fear it. So it's not this picture that many people have had when they go to church where God is there and the preacher sort of tells you how terrible God is. If you don't get yourself right, then it's overs for you. That's not what reverence means. It means to deeply respect and appreciate and acknowledge and love the Lord. What is the first great commandment that Jesus spoke of, which is in the Shema? Love the Lord your God. It doesn't say cower in the corner and don't you know how terrible he is. It doesn't say this. It says love the Lord your God. So fear the Lord. And interesting, the word Lord there is once again Jehovah. Fear the Lord. Worship, reverence, respect, acknowledgement, and care. All of these encompass what the Hebrew word means for fear. But the question I have to ask is when we unpack this, what does it truly mean to fear? What does it mean for us to fear the Lord as God's people? Because I want us to please get away from a physical expression. Please. People think you worship the Lord by lifting your hands. No, the lifting of the hands is not the worship. The worship comes from the heart. So you can have a physical expression. There's nothing wrong with it, but it's not the core of it. So what we don't want is the voice. Do you know the voice? I can't deal with the voice. People speak in a spiritual voice sometimes. Have you heard it? Mm. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know. Oh. Such holy people. They think that the voice makes them holy. Or if I show some physical manifestation for, or do something physically that that shows how much I worship or love the Lord. It's not about people. There's nothing wrong with lifting your hands. I, want, I do it. I do it this side. You can't always see it, but I'll do it this side. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a physical expression at all, but it comes from the heart that wants to worship. And it's not mm. interested in the people. To truly fear the Lord is not an external expression, but an internal belief and trust in the Lord. And that's why we are encouraged to fear the Lord. And this means 
24 hours a day, seven days a week. That when I wake up or I go to bed in that 24 hours, I fear the Lord. It's part of my life. It's not only a Sunday thing to fear the Lord. It is every single day. And how do we foster this godly fear? How do we foster it? How do we grow it? How do we actually live in it? The only way is not through emotion. So it's not through listening to worship songs 24-7 and evoking some emotion, which it does. I mean, I listen to the, when I'm preparing my sermon, and it's some really great words, and I, and I love listening to hymns and spiritual songs. It's good. But that's not how you're going to foster this godly fear of the Lord. What's going to foster godly fear and grow it and settle it is through reminding ourselves of who God is from his word. The more I read the word, the more I know the word, the more I know God's character, his nature, his love, his grace, his mercy, the more I am in awe of him, the more I revere him, the more I love him because I know him more. My love and reverence and fear of the Lord doesn't come from myself. It doesn't come through me expressing something physically. It comes through the knowledge of who he is. That it, the more I know him, the more I worship and love him. And so God's word is key for us to have that true godly fear. Look at verse 6 of Proverbs 3. When you look at verse 6, it says, In all your ways acknowledge him. If you truly and I truly fear the Lord, I will acknowledge him in all my ways. Because I will always be conscious, what would God think? What is God's will for me in my life, in this situation? It's constantly at the forefront of my thinking. And this will be the beginning of us knowing godly wisdom when God is part of my decision-making process, when God is part of the way that I interact with my family, with my friends at work, that I'm always thinking, is this godly? Is this what God would want? Also, what is important to God must be important to us. We must love what he loves and hate what he hates. And that's important because if I fear the Lord, then I will also hate the things that he hates. People often think that Christianity is like a 60s countercultural movement that everyone wants to wear tie dye and just love everyone. That's good to love people. But the Christian walk is also to distance yourself. And the text will tell us, of course, I'm not I'm preempting, but the text will tell us you must hate the things that God hates. And if we don't do that, then we are going to be in trouble. So we respect his word and his guidance and we respect him. And what will reflect that? What will truly reflect if we fear the Lord? It will be our testimony. And I'm not talking about what people can see. I'm talking about those times when we're alone, the times at home, the times behind closed doors. Do those times also reflect our adoration, respect, and reverence for the Lord? And I can't answer that for you. And you can't answer that for me. I'm just saying that my fear of the Lord and respect for the Lord cannot just be something I do publicly in front of people. It has to be something that when I'm alone, God is part of that part of my life. Okay. And it's a challenge. It's not always easy. It's not always, we're not always going to be fantastic toward our husbands or our wives or our children. We're not always going to get it right because they see the difficult parts. That's why pastors' children always have it more difficult because Harry sees me and sometimes in a different light because I'm at home. And it's important for me to maintain a godly testimony. I cannot do things that contradict my testimony. Even when it takes forever to get ready, I have to be godly. Get ready, get ready. So it's important. But look at the key for us to, share, to, to show the world and to show each other and to show ourselves that we fear the Lord. What is the key here? The key here is the second part. Look at the second part to the verse. It says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. 
depart from evil. The beginning of wisdom is not only fearing the Lord, but it's also departing from evil. Turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. So 2 Timothy 2, 22. It's a famous verse, but important. So fear the Lord and depart from evil. And, and, and Paul writes to Timothy and says, flee also youthful lusts. Now, it's quite interesting that as Solomon writes, he says, fear the Lord and depart from evil. Doesn't say fear the Lord and overcome evil. Doesn't say fear the Lord and fight evil. What does it say? Go. Because I, I don't know if you know this, but we're not strong enough to fight evil in your life. You're not strong enough to do that. What you need to do is cut off the circulation from evil in your life. Because when you expose yourself to evil and you expose yourself to temptation, you're in big trouble. So I used to go to um, support group meetings for drug and alcohol addiction. I used to help a few guys and, and spend time with them then. And they would ask me to go with them to the meeting. And it was quite funny that you would sometimes, not in those meetings, but generally when people didn't go to meetings, didn't have the conversation, they would often say, well, you know, I had a relapse and when I had a relapse because I went to a bar after 12 months to say that I want to see if I'm strong enough. It doesn't work. So here, Paul writes to Timothy and says, flee youthful lusts, but pursue righteousness. So run away from evil and run toward what? righteousness faith love peace with those who call on the lord out of a pure heart how beautiful is that about the church with those even with 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 god's people it's interesting so run away from evil run toward what is good ephesians 5 verse 3 look at ephesians 5 verse 3 So fear the Lord and depart from evil. In Ephesians 5, 3, it says, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as fitting for saints. So if we say we fear the Lord, I mean, I've spoken to people who've sworn at me and said, I'm a God-fearing man. Hmm, Okay. People that do dodgy things, but I'm a God-fearing man. Find this interesting with the footballers. Have you seen the footballers when they run into the pitch? They all genuflect. But their three girlfriends are in the stands. They're ten kids that don't know where they are. But they're God-fearing people. I'm not saying they might not believe. But there's more to that than just saying, I believe. Great for your salvation, but our Christian walk is more than that. If we say we fear the Lord, we must depart from evil. And that's the question again. Why would we as Christians engage with evil and even indulge it? Why would you do that? It's not wise. It's not wise to open doors in your life. In all spheres of life, we mustn't allow evil to come in. Firstly, I just wrote this spiritually. We cannot entertain false doctrine. We can't. You can't say that it doesn't matter what that person believes biblically or what's being taught or what's being preached. You can't have that because once false doctrine comes into a church and takes root, it's impossible to get it out unless you have to then start cutting off limbs, which gets awkward. So what we have to do is not allow false doctrine to take root. So in all spheres of our lives, we have to depart evil. Firstly, spiritually, false doctrine. Then Secondly, practically, and practically is don't put yourself in the position that could lead you to sin. Don't put yourself where temptation is. Another statement someone makes is, if you sit long enough in a barber shop, you're going to get a haircut. So if we're constantly exposing ourselves to evil, and we're constantly with evil friends and evil people, and if you constantly... Um, it says a married man spending time with that lady and you're constantly, what's going to happen? Where is it going to lead? I didn't know this was going to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And vice versa. 
Don't put yourself in a position where you could be overtaken by temptation. So practically, don't put yourself in that position. And also personally, so physically, don't put yourself there. And then also personally, don't allow evil thoughts to dwell in your mind. Remind yourself of scripture. Don't allow thoughts that are not constructive. And once again, someone said to me, don't allow thoughts that don't pay rent. Because there are some thoughts that just are there and they're just destructive. They're not actually constructive. So personally, don't think evil things. Don't dwell on evil things. Pray about them. If you're thinking something evil about someone, go to the Lord and speak to him about it, saying, Lord, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm thinking. Help me to, to, to think correctly about this. Because when those thoughts, because the whole process, especially for the younger people among us, it's a very simple process, really, but it's hard because it, it basically the way that we get to a, a really bad space in our lives is you have a thought, and that thought leads to an emotion. That emotion then leads to an action. That action leads to a habit, and that habit leads to a lifestyle. So when you think something, it creates an emotion in you. That emotion is very difficult then to say no of. So if you deal with a thought, it's better to deal with the thought than the emotion. Because once the emotion takes you, you're then going to act on it. And then you act on it once and you say, I shouldn't be doing that. But you think it again and you act again. And when you're doing this for a long period of time, what does it do? It becomes a habit. And when you continue in a habit, it becomes your lifestyle. And you look back and say, I was never like this. Of course not, because your thinking was the problem. So what does Romans chapter 12 say? We have to renew our minds because the battle's in here so godly wisdom needs to be in our minds so for us as god's people we mustn't be wise in our own eyes we must fear the lord and then depart from evil and then what's the consequence this is what we conclude with what is the blessings of wisdom what are these blessings when we go back to proverbs 3 it says Verse 8, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Now, I was wrestling with this quite a bit because the Hebrew words are different than what we think. But the concept is always the same. So Hebrew is quite complex at times. But what it says here, health to your flesh, it's quite interesting that the word health there means healing. Okay, so it's similar, healing. But the problem is the word flesh is not your not your body it's actually your navel so when you look at the hebrew word for flesh it's not your whole body it's your navel that's what the word means so it should read it will be health to your navel now it's not completely off because where do you get your feeding from as a baby through your navel that's quite interesting isn't it because sometimes in Hebrew, a part constitutes the whole. It does. I use the example for my three days and three nights friends. When you read in 1 Corinthians, he was raised on the third day. It was a third day. The beginning of the third day constitutes the whole day. In Hebrew, sometimes ear is used for the body. And here, the navel is used for the whole of you. But it's just an interesting way in which the word speaks. So healing to your flesh or your navel. Because the problem is that sin, and we're going to look at some texts now, sin has consequences to our whole being. So if we are going to be wise in our own eyes, reject God's wisdom, not fear the Lord, not depart from evil, it will not just affect part of you, it will affect the whole of you. So rejecting God's wisdom and living in your own wisdom will lead to illness and especially spiritually, but could also lead to physical consequences. So where, what are you talking about? Turn with me to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter one. Because often what happens is you hear people and they say, by his stripes, we are healed. And you'll go to a church and they'll say, no, no, I'll quote that verse. I, <laughs> I claim that verse. So that means I must be physically well. Um, that's not what it's speaking about. Because let's look at the context of what it's speaking about in Isaiah. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 1. We're going to read verse 5 and 6. So Isaiah chapter 1, 5 to 6 says, 
Why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. Now, the head there is the whole being. Not just a, your head. It's your whole being. The head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. So when it speaks in Isaiah 53 of the healing, what's it talking about there? It's not talking about physical. It's talking about spiritual because it's speaking here of Israel going away from God. And this is our condition as human beings. In our own state, we are filled with sores and evil. And even as a Christian, though you are saved, if you live in the world and live in the worldly thinking and you're living in your own thinking, you become sick. And sick is the right word. We're not going to use it in the, in the sort of British context because it's, I'm always awkward. Like, should I say illness or sick? I grew up saying, if you're sick, you're sick. You've got a cold or whatever, that's sick. But yeah, it's like, no, no, that means something else. Awkward. So I'm going to use it biblically. Sick. The whole body is sick. Turn with me to Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. And it says here, and he said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull, the ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they shall see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. It's talking here about spiritual struggles. And so what Solomon is writing about here is the fact that to live in worldly wisdom or your own wisdom, not God's, will cause problems. And to acknowledge the Lord and to fear him will then bring health to your whole flesh, your whole being, your whole you. And then secondly, also says strength to your bones. Also, interesting, the word strength. Like I'm thinking strength. Now look at what the Hebrew word means. And the Hebrew word for strength there is moisture, drink, or the King James has it right, marrow. So if you've got a King James with you, say, well, marrow to your bones. Mm -hmm. Because what does marrow do to, have you seen a bone that, when, when, when something's died on the side of the road and everything has died, and why does the bone look without marrow in it? It looks dry. So when I go to the butcher here, the butcher's fantastic. I'm, they ask me to say this. They are fantastic in Marlow. And so we go to the meat hook and we get some meat and they say, do you want a bone for your dog with marrow in it? Yes. So they give me this bone. I've still got the bone in my deep freeze. Now, of course, I've frozen it, but it's still got marrow in it. Now, I remember when Harry, um, when Charlie, sorry, not Harry, when Charlie, <laughs> I get them confused the whole time. It's my kids, my kids. I'm just glad I don't have a third son, there's a daughter coming. Um, but, but when Charlie ate it as a, as, a, as, as a puppy, he got like all like, you know, because he ate too much marrow because it's so fatty. But the issue is that marrow is important because it keeps what? What does it do to the bone? It keeps it moisturized, keeps it alive. And so godly wisdom and fearing the Lord and acknowledge him will be godly life in you strength and life in your very bones and can you see bones you can't see it it's inside of you it is um, vitality and life so why are we feeling like this as people why do you feel drained emotionally and personally and spiritually why do we feel the way we feel it's because god's word is not always present in our lives we don't always fear him. Yes, you believe, but that's not that reverence and that awe daily of the Lord. And it drains us of life. Our bones become dry and brittle. And even here, bones is another word for your whole being in the context and heart's use. And we must be reminded as we conclude of the, Lord, the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did he say? I am the what of life, the bread of life, and I'm the living water, sustenance, life to us. 
So as Christians, people walk past this church and see Keith did this beautiful post outside. And I can imagine the second topic for our series is fear the Lord. I can imagine some teenagers walking by or other people going, oh, these people fear the Lord. You know, they're trying to be all holier than thou. It's not about that at all. It's about we know our source of life, don't we? We know where life is found. We know where that moisture is found to exist. We know where the green pastures are. And if you are feeling this morning drained and you're just feeling slightly distracted or, or disillusioned, just go back to the source of wisdom and draw from the well and draw from the source and you will have life. Thank you. And therefore, in conclusion, God's wisdom and surrendering to him and acknowledging him will be health and strength to us, body, soul, and spirit. Not talking about the physical joints, just talking about the very life that we have. We will be health and strength in Christ. Let us pray. Yeah. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And we pray, Lord, that today as we have heard your word, that we will truly hold on to your word, apply it in our lives. Help us, Lord, to allow your word to settle in our hearts. Help us to draw from it, to receive that strength and that life from you. Help us to live in godly fear every single day. Amen. Help us, Lord, to also remember that we are examples to each other to live in that godly fear. And thank you, Lord that you are there for us. We worship you and we praise you, Lord, today. Amen. Please stand for our concluding song. Thank you.